Um, before opening uh, the discussion to the floor, I'd like to give the three uh, speakers an opportunity to respond to any of the comments that Michael and Jamie made. And perhaps, Guido, if you don't mind, you could begin, because um, I think it was Jamie raised the, a, a very um, straightforward question about uh, the data quality in Africa. Yeah, thanks, um, uh, Jamie. I knew you were going to catch this one. Um, strictly speaking, we have better studies on Africa. The data, as we all know, the raw data isn't uh, isn't as good as elsewhere. But we now have a long, really quite quite a long series of in-depth studies using a variety of methods of how much would it take to achieve the Millennium Development Goals. The Africa Com Commission under Nick Stern at the time, uh, research work, um, the Millennium Project looked into this. François Bourguignon's team at the World Bank has done a lot on it. And then, of course, uh, more recently, the MDG Africa Steering Group. And what we have is really quite a convergence around not, not only the, the overall resource package, but also um, the financing, how much of it would have to be externally financed versus domestically financed, and how that can be put into a macroeconomic framework. I mean, let's, you know, let's not forget the IMF has really gone around, I believe, now five or six countries in Africa where they have developed scaled-up macro scenarios for how a Glen Eagle's consistent um, financing inflow would be programmed. That wasn't even a, this this work wasn't a, wasn't available three years ago. Three years ago, people were still saying macro stability, macro stability. You can't scale up. That that level of work we don't have for other LDCs outside Africa, and that's why maybe uniquely Africa is in a better position. If I would have to, if I were asked to replicate these numbers for other uh, LDCs, I'd be much harder pushed. Um, but this is not to say that this work shouldn't be done. In fact, it must be done. If I can just, Neil, because you, you, know, you gave us the opportunity, maybe I'd just like to add two quick points because we're sort of moving on to the messaging. Michael and Jamie have both said we don't need any more financing mechanisms. And I would like to, from my view, I'd like to clarify that. I think what we need is, what we do not need is any more disbursement mechanisms. We have the Global Fund that works for health, and my personal view is very simplistic. That's what should be used for infectious diseases and health systems. But what we do need is we need more revenue, resource mobilization mechanisms. Because the system we currently have whereby ODA depends on annual appropriations and national budgets just doesn't work. And that's where climate change is a huge opportunity because you can have um, uh, revenue make, make, raising mechanisms like maritime tax, um, uh, tax on, on international air transport and so forth that really, um, that really can work and I think will command a lot more uh, support in the public than than just outright budget, uh, budget appropriations, and they will be predictable, going to your point, Jamie, about medium-term targets. And finally, um, let's not forget the good news. The New York Times had a fantastic story yesterday about fall, uh, uh, the fall in maternal mortality. It's another indication of how development works. And I think that's what we need to use as the argument for, for doing more of the same. It works. It works thanks to development assistance. We just need to do more, and everyone wants to be part of success. Thank you very much, Guido. Um, Jess, you wanted a quick um, Just word. one quick reiteration of a point that Jamie also made in terms of the fast start financing, the fact that it's uh, largely unlikely to be additional. I think this is something that um, we should really be putting pressure on political leaders to try and secure. But also I think that given the current forms of finance and the way that money is being distributed, it's largely going to set the stage for how things continue in the future. So there's a lot of lessons that can be learned in terms of what's going on, on now to see what it will be like in the future. Thank you. And Nicola? Yes. I Just uh, quickly a couple of points. The first, that uh, yes, the knowledge that the most important point is to ensure that uh, rich countries are join the 0.7 uh, target in terms of development. Uh, but in, uh, in the graph that uh, I presented, just I wanted to underline uh, uh, what can be the consequences uh, between uh, a scenario that includes additionality in terms uh, mm. between climate finance and uh, traditional ODA, and the consequences if uh, we acknowledge a full uh, uh, diversion of climate finance. So uh, we have to say the most important point of the graph is that there is really a huge, huge gap between those two scenarios, the one including additionality and the one excluding additionalities. Other two quick points, the consensus. I think uh, the first step uh, forward will be to, uh, to bet on research. 
two, two important points. The first is that, okay, we all acknowledge probably in this room that uh, there is overlapping between ad adaptation and development. But uh, to what extent is that it is uh, overlapping? What are the adaptation actions for which there is a trade-off between development and adaptation? I think that um, to the uh, calculation, if we want to use this, uh, this word, about the extent of this overlapping between adaptation and development, research still makes, uh, needs to make step, step forward. So it will be very important to generate a consensus. And second, it's very important also to finally to distinguish clearly mitigation and adaptation. Because probably in many cases for mitigation, it's much more difficult to find overlaps between the development and mitigation. If we think about uh, the building of an hydropower station in a dense uh, urban area, probably it's much more difficult to find an overlap between mitigation and adaptation. And probably this is the contradiction. Mitigation is, is the one that probably rich countries will be more willing to, to finance. Why? Because if there is mitigation, there are less emissions and less climate change damages also for, for rich countries. But probably for mitigation, there, is, there are less opportunity rather than adaptations for uh, real development. Thank you very much, Nicola. And um, I'd just like to take the, 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 the chair's uh, position just to, to reflect back on Nicola's uh, graphs. And what struck me most noticeably with those graphs is what will really affect the outcome in aid receiving countries, be it for development or for climate change adaptation, will be whether or not the 0.7% GNI pledge is met or not. And I think there's still very real big questions over that. We now have 15 minutes left to run in this meeting, so the floor is now open, um, and please uh, feel free to raise questions to the panelists or to make your own point of view known to the meeting. Um, in doing so, I just ask you to do two things. Firstly, to stand up so that we can clearly see you. And secondly, to introduce yourself and the organization that you have come. And I'll try and take two or three people at one time to speed us on our way. So hands up, please. One, and then two, and three. So that's our first three questions. Hi, it's Andres Tochniel, founder of Emers Proposal, which, is, which has been debated by the uh, advisory group. Uh, and it has been mentioned by Guido. Uh, I truly believe that uh, the Copenhagen Accord provides one word which is very important. It talks about alternative financing. If we define additional financing as a new, predictable, and perhaps even coming from international sources, then it would be definitely additional. And I'm pleased to report that the IMS proposal is now being uh, squarely on the table of the advisory group. It's also uh, being evaluated by the, a dedicated expert group in International Maritime Organization. Uh, this is not publicly available, but I can give you the proposal if you give me a, a card. And uh, what we need is extra push or pull from developing countries. I presented that in Bangkok to African group. It was very well received. It is in official documents of the UNFCCC. What we need is extra pull from developing countries to understand that they would not pay into that that would be only paid by developed countries, raising $10 billion in 2013 up to $20 billion in 2020. Truly international. So I, I agree we uh, additional means new money. Thank you. Thank you very much. And perhaps the, the speakers will come back and talk about emails after the two more questions. Firstly, the gentleman over there. Thank you. Hi, uh, Tom Pickin. I'm an international climate policy advisor with Friends of the Earth. Um, I won't take on the challenge to the environment uh, movement there about how we would feel about being marketed for better um, better development finance flows, but um, I would like to take up the issue more broadly um, around not just the practical um, issues about how climate and development finance are both tracked and, and delivered, but I think we, we also need to be careful about how we view climate finance. There's a lot of references to climate aid. There's a lot of references to, to, to this concept that it is a donor-recipient relationship. And we need to be very clear and careful that um, it is reparations on the one hand, particularly for adaptation. And on the, in, the, in the second regard, it is um, 
it is a it is a, a plea and and a request to avoid carbon cheap development and therefore again it's recompense for the additional incremental costs in ensuring that that development is indeed clean and sustainable so there is a real risk here of when we talk about how to support development finance by climate aid that we are indeed making it less politically uh, necessary for that climate finance to actually be, del be delivered because it changes the relationship whether you, you consider a country a debtor country or a donor country as to the, the necessity to deliver that, that finance. Um, I also just wanted to pick up on the additionality issue and um, it's something which we didn't touch much on here although it was in the first set of presentation slides and that is around the role of carbon market finance and um, for it to be listed as additional, particularly with relation to RED, is very troubling um, for, for people who are closely engaged in, in forest climate policy. Because, of course, carbon market finance through RED forest policy would not actually fulfill an additionality criteria if you view climate finance as also needing to be additional to mitigation commitments because of course the payment for forest protection would be at the expense of industrial emissions reductions, which in turn lead us uh, much further away from being able to fulfill overall climate goals. Um, so just two thoughts there. Thank you very much, and, and two very important issues which mm. hopefully we can get back to. We have one additional speaker to complete the first set. Um, my name is Megan Rowling. I work as a journalist for Reuters AlertNet. Um, I'm sensing a little bit of um, disagreement over whether any battles are worth fighting over fast start finance or not. Um, and Jessica, you sort of said that you know we need to put pressure on politicians. Jamie, you said that it's pretty much sewn up already. It's bullshit. It's already money that's been accounted for. People are saying that we could make progress on financing in the climate change negotiations this year. Um, but would that have to be at the expense of um, doing anything about fast track finance being new and additional? And are developing countries just going to roll over on this one and say, hey, there's nothing we can do about this 30 billion up to 2012. We've got a bigger battle to fight. Does it matter if we don't fight the little battle over fast start finance? And if we do, is this actually going to destroy any notions of trust, really hold up the negotiations going towards Cancun. I'm already getting a clear sense of what the consensus is on that among developing countries or even among people who are you know, watching this very, very closely. Thank you again for a very interesting question. I, I would like to go through all the panelists um, and give each person an opportunity to comment. And I'd like to start with the, the, the two speakers who are, are remotely joining this meeting. So Guido and Michael, if you have any responses to any of the three first questions. Okay. Um, very quickly, excellent points. Um, starting with the last one, I think it is worth picking a fight um, over climate finance. and. Again, coming back to the messaging, to the politics point, climate is one of the few things where leaders, in, particularly in Europe, actually feel personally responsible for. Development was always something that was happening elsewhere. That was a nice to have. And yes, the moral and the ethical arguments are strong, but with climate change, there really is a deeper level of commitment. And what I think the Europeans have in particular realized is that you cannot get, you will not get a climate deal without real financing. They will not be able to peel the LDCs off China. Um, if they don't put money on the table. That's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to, to demonstrate that money really uh, generates results, and that's really what, we, what we're in the business of showing. I think on the previous two points, I would just like to you know, put in a, maybe a dose of, um, of skepticism about this donor-recipient relationship um, uh, issue. I mean, I totally agree with the, with the, with the rationale that climate, change, uh, climate finance shouldn't be seen as sort of a begging ball being passed around, um, but the truth of the matter is, and this is maybe, maybe where I'm just too much of a hard-nosed realist here, is whenever money is being put on the table for international transfers, you're going to have a donor-recipient relationship. You are. You can't get away from it. We'd like, it to, we'd like to wish it away, but it's going to be there. And you will have to have accountability, all the points that, that Michael um, uh, spoke about, which is why I think it's so important to use the scalable, transparent, efficient mechanisms like the Global Fund that have really proven their worth. If Michael hasn't got anything to say just now, I'll pass on to Jess. And perhaps, Jess, you can 
start up by picking up on the EMERS proposal. Um, yeah, thanks, Andre, for your comments. Um, for, uh, for those of you who are unaware of EMERS, I would um, suggest you get in touch with Andre to find out a bit more. But um, this is an example of one of the proposals that we have reviewed within the, the report with that we um, was commissioned by one. Um, it's around a, an international maritime levy or fee. Um, it, it does meet all these criteria that we've been discussing. Discussing It would be created as a new, an additional um, resource generation mobilization function. It would be predictable. It would be international and would be created in sort of an automatic, ongoing way. So there, there wouldn't be pressure from um, national gov governments to, to contribute from their ODI budgets. Um, one last comment just to reflect on the question from the woman from Reuters. Um, <coughs> I would agree with, with Guido's comments, but also just to mention that all of the, the proposals that are on the table for creating new sources of finance wouldn't be in place until at least 2012, um, which means that there's no chance that those are going to contribute to any sort of fast start finance. So that's just one consideration to keep in mind when thinking about where the pressure should be placed. Um, the other indication is that the, the needs for adaptation in particular increase over time, which also is sort of a positive in terms of um, ramping up the amount of finance that is available. Thank you. Nicole, if, perhaps if you could address the issue of the carbon market and the, the question of additionality. Yes, just uh, a few words. I think that uh, we should be very, um, uh, we should encourage the introduction of carbon uh, mechanisms. I think for two reasons. The first is that, uh, I'll show by uh, much literature, the, um, all these carbon mech flexible mechanisms, the development mechanisms, red, uh, a lot of opportunity for rich countries to decrease abatement costs. And if rich countries have the opportunity to decrease by flexible mechanism, uh, this cost uh, is an opportunity to create consensus over global uh, environmental agreements. Second point, another interesting point is that many times those funds create uh, interesting uh, spillovers on local community in terms of development. So additionality or not, from a philosophical point of view, <laughs> difficult to answer, but the opportunities provided by car the carbon mechanisms are very interesting from uh, my point of view. And Jamie, do you have any additional comments? Yes. Um, first of all, on, on the issue, when I said bullshit, what, what I meant was... <laughs> um, Don't quote him, please. <laughs> <laughs> what I meant was that it is bullshit that um, the money could be additional because it's already there. Um, so it's like it's not possible, um, technically. Um, and indeed, decisions being made now uh, will dictate how much money is flowing in 2012-13. Similarly, the DAC figures that came out, you know, 36 hours ago refer to decisions made in really in 2007, early 2008. One of the complex things about development assistance flows in the same will go for climate is that there's this big lag. So, um, you know, and, and it's, it's when, and I get angry because it's the claim of additionality when it cannot be possible that is so blatant that I think is uh, justification for irritation. Um, and, uh, you know, and, I, and I, I think it's very important to point that out. The, the, ba the, the fights that are worth having right now about that are um, about the, the way money is spent and the quality of it, um, about existing current flows. That is worth having right now. <laughs> and then laying the groundwork now for those more interim targets, 2013, 14, 15, and making sure that those are truly additional and the degree to which they are is most likely to be decided by this high-level panel and the kind of quality of proposals it comes up with. Um, so um, that's what I'd say on that. On the uh, point about uh, reparations and, all of, uh, and, and that approach, I mean, I think that's where I, I'd like to see a better, uh, maybe high-level dialogue, uh, other than the mm -hmm. panel on climate finance, ab about exactly how best to phrase and talk about this. Because I think that we will walk into some, we already are, some, some complex territory in terms of how what is marketed to whom and why that will set certain bells ringing in different places that aren't intended. You can talk about development also as reparations if you wish. Uh, we worked in the debt cancellation movement. You could describe much of that as, you know, Cold War loans that were illicit. So, you know, th there's, there's a lot of common language there in some ways, but you also find that the justice argument, which is the right way forward in terms of, you know, it's fully justified, 
is also um, sometimes becomes an excuse for um, uh, suboptimal pl planning and aid programs and development programs. Um, and, and that's not acceptable either. So it, you've got to find a way to make sure the money is still well spent. And, uh, and one of the things that might be very intriguing in this area are things that are not so much government to government and country based transfers. Are there things that actually about the citizens involved who, who's, who, who, who are experiencing the injustice getting something directly? Um, and, uh, and what can be done in those areas, even though in this country we tend to prefer um, budget support and various such approaches, you know, there might be something there to explore further. Thank you, Jamie. And in fact, it's an interesting uh, sort of idea you've raised. Perhaps such a meeting, such a convening, should happen in New Delhi or Beijing rather than in London, because getting want to build up to South Africa in 20 precisely getting a, a, a global voice rather than a northern voice is really important when it comes to climate finance. We've probably just got a couple more minutes to the end of this meeting. So if anyone has any burning question they'd like to ask, please pop up your hand. And if, yes, one last question then, please. Yeah. Oh, okay. My name is Peter Taylor. I'm an ec ecological advisor. Um, I'm coming to this whole issue quite new, in a sense, from, from looking at development aid and having looked at climate change. And I'm really struck by how little money goes to the grassroots, the people most vulnerable and at risk to climate change. I'm looking at sort of 75% of the... The, the people defined as in poverty are actually in agriculture. And then looking at the kind of paradigm of aid which is supposed to help them and hasn't, however much money has gone into it, how, how very small amounts are trickling to that level. So these are the people who are most vulnerable. But when I look at the development model that's supposed to help them, I don't see a way of getting that money to them. I don't see that money is actually necessarily even the problem, that, or what will help them. And so all of this talk, especially with this whole issue of mitigation and adaptation, tiny amount of funding going into adaptation, vast amounts into mitigation. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the money that might become available, that's very largely relating to mitigation. In other words, it's carbon funding. And they expect, therefore, a carbon issue, a carbon credit at the end of it. So that's why you get wind turbines in Turkana, for example or you know, biofuels in, 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 in rainforests. So you, you're facing a, a vast amount of development happening through mitigation. Uh, that's your only additional money. And I don't see any mechanism that you have for helping those people really at the, 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 the sort of uh, blunt end, you know, the really vulnerable people. And, and just one final comment, and that is most of the climate models are in question at this time. We've had 10 or 15 years. Uh, of climate behaving not as the models predict. And that's, that's climate change. That, that's what these people face right now and uh, not, not in you know, 50 years' time. Thank you very much. But there probably lies the danger of asking a question when we've overrun our time already mm -hmm. because it's a very important and valuable question, but as broad as our discussion. However, the question was asked, would anyone from the panel like to just quickly reflect on that? Well, <laughs> perhaps it was, it's such a big question that, that it was very difficult uh, to respond in, in such a short time, but it, it, it's something that needs to be uh, followed up um, perhaps in a, uh, in a later, at a later meeting. I'm going to have to stop, um, Guido, um, because we have run out of time here at ODI. So it just leaves me to thank all the speakers who gave, I think, very um, insightful and clear presentations. Those presentations will be up on the ODI website in the next 24 hours. In addition, there will be a written record of the meeting um, also on the ODI website, so please use that as a resource to come back to. And it then just leaves me to thank you all very much for attending this meeting, and I hope you got something out of it. Thank you very much indeed.